I've got the easy job of not talking about the research, but just talking about how we set up the management procedures within Loughborough to manage our projects. So a good place to start is at the beginning, um, well, as good a place as any. So of the three grand challenges within the centre, the eco-efficiency grand challenge, eco-factory, and sustainable industrial systems, um, Loughborough is basically, uh, Loughborough's th project that it's leading is in the eco-factory, the first three. And these are resource efficient manufacturing, which is looking at a proactive approach to reducing materials, um, water and energy. They're the three um, resources that we focus on and then mainly the consumption in the manufacturing plant. Um, the second one is zero waste, zero emissions. And that's more taking a reactive approach to material waste from manufacturing, but across the whole supply chain rather than just within that confines of the factory. And then eco-intelligent factories is about how you make intelligent decisions, bring environmental decisions into your manufacturing um, management. So, as I mentioned, we've got three projects. We're now, um, we started all three. Um, we've got an RA in place um, on each of the projects, and each of these projects is three years. And we're now hoping to appoint the PhDs uh, in the next uh, month. Obviously, these are big areas. I mean, we're discussing it today. You're clearly, with those kind of resources, you're not going to solve all the problems. So how do we structure the projects to ensure that we make some impacts um, within these challenges and deliver some, some benefits? So first of all, the synergy across all these projects, there's three key, key things. There's obviously technologies and processes. Um, there's the modeling and measurement. And then there's the control and management. And of course, just like those projects I described, there's a relationship between these. Some of them are enabling technologies to the others and so on. Um, and these really sort of inform the structure of what we call the sub-projects that exist within these, these, other, these three Grand Challenge um, projects. So we look at it like this, you can see you've got the control management thing going in one, uh, sort of horizontally, and then the projects, if you like, in a vertical structure. So like a sort of matrix structure for the, for the way we manage the projects. And as you can see, some of these sub-projects are larger than others in terms of the amount of resource it takes up. Some are smaller. Some of them have been informed by the need from one of the other projects and also potentially provide solutions to achieving the goals of the other project. And then, of course, as I say, we've got the PhD, which we're aiming to appoint in the next month. So bringing that back together, as I mentioned, we've got these three projects. There's also Sustained Value, which is under the Ecofactory Grand Challenge, which you'll hear about tomorrow, I believe. Um, and then you've got this horizontal connection of these three different areas. So, very quick, brief presentation. We obviously want to get on to the, the meat, as it were, in terms of what we've actually been doing um, since we started these projects. We're going to hear from each of the RAs who's running and leading the research. Uh, Dr. Oliver Gold, Michael Barwood, and Alessandro Simon, who are each leading these three grand challenges. And there'll be a 20-minute presentation. We're not going to take questions after each one. Instead, we'll have questions at the end of all three, moderated by Dr. Elliot Woolley, who's sitting here. So I think uh, without further ado, we'll start with Oliver Gold on resource efficient manufacturing. Thank you, James. And hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Oliver Gold, and I'm going to tell you about the resource, resource efficient manufacturing project that I've been working on last few months. So, what are the aims and objectives of REM? We want to improve the sustainability of manufacturing through increasing res resource efficiency. So, reducing consumption whilst increasing output. And to do this, we want to develop novel technologies, methodologies and tools to support this in terms of radical improvements. Why is the research needed? The present uh, trajectory of consumption is unsustainable, as we've heard earlier today. And the effect effectiveness of current approaches to supporting improvements is, uh, and impl implementing strategies has largely peaked. So manufacturers require decision-making support in order to make further resource efficiency gains. The project scope when I mention uh, resources, I'm talking about materials, energy, and water, and that's within the factory. Uh, and energy and water modeling tools have been developed by smart team members um, in the past, so I'm going to focus at the moment on material efficiency. 
as James mentioned, we break stuff down into the sub-projects. And my first sub-project is to do with technology. And uh, there's the, uh, an IR camera sensing technology example where we're identifying different polymer types based on their uh, characteristics and response to changes in heat. And this is demonstrated in the poster area you may have seen today already. Uh, second project is going to be a modeling project, and I'm going to look at material flow modeling. Third project is going to be looking at control and management, and I want to build a customized KPI selection tool for evaluating material efficiency. Today I'm going to focus on talking to you about the material flow modeling tool in more detail. The material flow modeling tool. So what material efficiency strategies already exist that might be supported by material flow modeling? Generally, we can work to reduce yield loss within a manufacturing system, or we can use less material, provide the same service for a product. At the beginning of this uh, reducing yield loss strategy, we can look at individual processes and optimize these, uh, increase the efficiency of your processes. This is probably the more obvious choice, um, and this can be built upon by looking at more, looking at your production optimization, the entire optimization of uh, the system in the factory. Uh, moving on to other strategies, you have material elimination, material substitution, and also dematerialized service, which we talked about just earlier, a few examples of. Um, and these all kind of follow the general using less material, providing the same service uh, kind of theme. And they're supported by operational considerations. It, these are weighted towards the bottom, towards process and production optimization, and design uh, considerations which are weighted towards the top generally. So what are the challenges to ma modeling material flow? Well, we've identified that with quantitative data, the complexity of models is currently manageable, and it's just to do with the, the, the issue of scale, how much data you're working with, what's your processing power, how much uh, data can your models handle. So this is increased by a variety of materials, number of process stages, and the types of the processes, so the entries and exit points per process. But the, the major challenge that we've identified is to look at um, how to include qualitative data within a model. And with this, I'm thinking about material transformations, which I will describe in more detail in a, in a little bit. So current tools already exist relevant to material efficiency, and I'm just gonna prevent a uh, present a, uh, an overview of these tools, uh, where they're used, and some strengths and weaknesses, very briefly. So we've got material selection charts and the CES. So this is to select substitute materials, and this is primarily in used in the design phase. And in this example, you can identify substitute materials with lower embodied energies, but similar stiffnesses. Um, as you may imagine, the impact on the product manufacture is not considered within this tool. Material requirements planning is a uh, established tool which looks at optimizing the inventory of materials in a production system, manufacturing system. Um, however, the efficiency of material consumption is not indicated and there's no description of material flow. Isanki looks at flow, it looks at material flow or whatever other parameter you wish to look at. So you can use eSanki, link it to data sheets and then um, produce Sankey diagrams which illustrate the flow of materials and possible waste points and things like this. But there's only single parameters considered and it doesn't look at environmental impact. LCA looks at environmental impact uh, and you can use it to establish the impacts of a product from a materials perspective, if you wish. But it's not designed to examine material efficiency, and it's not designed for flow modeling. It's mainly used to compare two products, or uh, a number of different products, and determine the preference based on environmental impact. 
Umberto brings together the ideas of LCA and the Sankey generator, eSankey, to be able to produce, uh, to combine the approaches to produce Sankey flow diagrams. Uh, and in this example, you've got um, the impact flow during an electricity generation process uh, illustrated in a Sankey diagram format. Um, and as, as you can see, this is a quant quantitative data flow and there's no qualitative information considered. So the research and development, how do we advance what already exists? How do we improve on the tools I briefly um, indicated just then? We want to include qualitative data in a quantitative material flow model. And we need to do this to understand the implication of material transformations. And this is to enable transformations to be modeled each stage in a process, each process stage, and to attribute the impacts associated at process, product, and plant level. Uh, material transformation is the key concept for this modeling tool. And there are hundreds of raw materials, but transformations further expand the range by altering the character of materials as they flow through the manufacturing system. Transformations um, I would describe as things such as changes to physical state, so gas, liquid, solid, mechanical changes, so cutting or shape change, or combination of materials. And this introduces the uh, issues of reversibility of combinations where uh, materials may be irreversibly combined, reversibly combined, or somewhere in the middle. <coughs> so this first example is a very simple example of how uh, a, a sheet of metal A changes shape. This is a, a transformation where uh, you have A bent into the second piece of A, and there's uh, energy is consumed over time. Very simple process. Similarly, the same sheet of metal is divided, waste material is produced, and you have two portions of the uh, three portions of the original material. So that's got a mass balance, a quantitative uh, implication with that transformation. Further, is uh, the same metal sheet is spray coated, and um, so you have a combination of material A and B. You have some waste product from the spray coating, but um, importantly in this transformation, it's the, there's a combination of materials. So this coating may be uh, reversibly or irreversibly combined or somewhere in between. So clearly transformations are important when considering uh, impacts on other resources in manufacturing such as energy and water. The value of materials flowing through manufacturing, so you could have uh, more valuable materials being entangled with larger volumes of uh, less valuable materials, you can have storage implications and also impacts on waste management. Looking at material transformation, what does this allow us to do? Well, I gave you some examples of uh, some material efficiency strategies here and what we want to be, uh, what material transformation will allow us to do is simulate the consequences of implementing these strategies, which may have qualitative implications on material flow. So, for example, we can look at production optimization, and this is um, not changing the product, not changing the materials used, and not changing the processes used in this, but changing the configuration or the sequencing of these processes. Another example could be material substitution, and this is looking at the impact of substituting materials in the manufacturing process. Another big thing that transformation hopefully will allow us to do is characterize the materials in detail. So by characterizing the materials, you inform us the impact of the waste materials produced, and this um, suggests an information link to the zero waste, zero emissions uh, project and tools which Michael's going to talk about next. So to illustrate uh, my uh, demonstration uh, of, the, of the tool that I've got put together, um, I'm going to introduce you to a production line, a very simple production line. Starts, it's a bottling procedure. Starts with molding of the bottle, 
followed by filling, cupping, and then labeling of the bottle. And the tool is broken up into, th into three modules. There's the material flow model itself, which examines the bottling system, a scenario planner module, so you're looking at what if scenarios, what if you use uh, different material efficiency strategies, uh, and in this example, I'll be talking about production optimization, but we could also look at material substitution in future. And then finally, an assessment module where you compare um, the scenarios uh, based on selected metrics and decide where your impro improvements may lie. So I'm just going to go to the tool itself. So this is a tool definition. This is a demonstration of the tool. Um, and here we have the material flow model. I don't know if you can just about see that. Um, and here we've got the processes I just uh, described in the last slide. And the uh, Sankey diagram output, which is set to mass flow. So we can look at the entire process, molding process, filling process, capping, and then labeling. And in this example, you can see, highlighted in red, the labeling process is the least efficient process. It's very inefficient. It's less than 90%, but run with me here. This is for illustration purposes. This isn't real data. So the next module, we're going to look at the scenario planner. We're going to look at some production strategies, and we're trying to optimize the production configuration. So here we can choose alternative configurations uh, by understanding the transformations at each process stage this is going to allow us to uh, change the sequencing the orders the order of the processes within the entire production to produce the same product so here we've got an alternative production here where the labeling um, process has been moved to second in the line So if we compare the scenarios in this third module, we've got the original process here, which we'll compare to the new configuration. And in these two graphs, you can see uh, the uh, individual process efficiencies in this blue line and the cumulative waste produced throughout the production is the, re is the red line. And as you can see, the uh, blue line, most inefficient process labeling leads to the, the most significant contribution to waste in terms of mass. Changing the order of the, uh, the sequencing of the processes, we've got the same uh, individual process efficiencies, but we have vastly reduced the uh, cumulative waste of the entire production process. So average process yield is the same for both both scenarios, but we have a significant decrease in total waste. Now, the idea is to have this, uh, to be able to uh, use this tool to compare s scenarios based on a range of KPIs, which could be things such as recyclable waste or um, embodied energy or things, whatever you, you want to look at. So what are the outcomes of looking at the alternative production scenario? We've changed the order of the uh, production uh, uh, scenario. Uh, we've changed the order of the production, very simple, and uh, we've moved the labeling process second in line. The result of this is material efficiency has been improved in terms of total waste reduction uh, which is a, qu a quantitative consideration, and then also in terms of a proportion of recoverable or recyclable waste. So that's been increased. So, for example, um, the most inefficient process, this labeling process, previously you might have to waste four different uh, materials, the contents, the label, the bottle, and the cap. Uh, however, you've only got two materials here, which might be easier to uh, recover the materials, just wash the bottle, wash the label off the bottle, and you could perhaps feed the bottles back into the beginning, into the uh, initial process. So those are the benefits 
of uh, looking at different scenarios. In summary, REM is a massive challenge, and we're looking at this massive challenge in terms of the sub-projects, focusing on the key challenges to in, uh, deliver the greatest impact. So I want to expand the material flow modeling tool, want to expand production optimization as a, as a, uh, a scenario option, but also start looking at substitution, things such as elimination and dematerialization. So as a Loughborough undergraduate, I'm very familiar with the uh, saying, get involved, and I'd like you to get involved. So your input is very welcome. We'd like to work with industry to validate and assess the general tool based on case studies. And then also we'd like to develop industry or sector specific uh, material flow modeling tools. And any REM challenges requiring technology development, we'd like to hear from you if you have any ideas or input. Thank you very much. I will now pass you on to Dr. Michael Barwood, talking about zero waste, zero emissions. Right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Oliver. My, uh, my name is Michael Barwood, and I'll be giving this presentation on zero waste, zero emissions, which is being currently carried out at Loughborough University. So, uh, first a quick overview of what the presentation content will be about. Um, we're going to cover the actual need for zero waste, zero emission um, research. We're then going to move on to the project objectives, followed by the current progress that we've made so far. Uh, this will be covering the first three sub-projects that we've carried out, including a project on recycling technology, waste modeling, and metrics and management. And then to conclude, we'll just be going through a quick slide about future work. So, why are zero waste factories an important strategical goal? Current levels of waste generation are unsustainable, and we are losing a lot of valuable value from the resources we're wasting. There is very poor manufacturing support for waste modeling at a supply chain level. And at present, many companies do not often consider the environmental impacts of the waste management processes themselves. So the objectives of the Zero Waste, Zero Emissions project is to cover three key areas. So we'd like to cover technology, modeling, and management. So in regards to technology, we'd like to develop new recycling technologies as well as improve existing recycling and end of life processes. We'd like to, for modeling, create novel methods for modeling as well as visualizing the waste flows throughout a supply chain. And then for management, we want to investigate and generate new metrics for waste management which consider the environmental impacts of that process. So, straight on to the first sub-project, which is in the technology area. So, what are the major challenges faced by recycling technologies today? Well, due to large quantities and various sizes of waste, current recycling technologies often rely on fragmentation processes and techniques. So, this is in order to uh, reduce the size of the waste so it's more manageable for sorting and separation processes later on in the chain. However, when more than one waste is fragmented at the same time, you tend to get interlinking of the waste, so that when it comes to sorting and separating, they become very difficult, if not if at all, to, uh, to separate or sort. So if we can pre-sort or pre-concentrate um, this waste before fragmentation, we could actually vastly improve the recyclic quality. This would mean we could then work more towards a closed-loop manufacturing system where the higher quality recyclate can be used to replace virgin materials. So as an example, we've um, chosen to compare conventional vehicles with hybrid and electric vehicles. So current recycling processes for vehicles, uh, conventional vehicles, are not able to recover the valuable materials that are now found in more modern um, electric and hybrid vehicles. So within a uh, conventional vehicle, the main value is found in the large amounts of ferrous and non-ferrous metals. So typically when these vehicles are depolluted, 
they are fragmented as an or shredded as an entire vehicle. So this produces quite a mix of, materi of uh, waste materials. However, the metal fractions of these are fairly easily separated with current recycling techniques. However, a hybrid vehicle, uh, which now uses more modern uh, composites and plastics to lightweight the, uh, uh, the vehicle so it's uh, more environmental during use, um, its value is mostly found in the electronic components which now contain very valuable materials such as rare earth elements as well as strategically important metals. So when this car is put through the conventional recycling techniques, the rare earths and uh, strategically important metals tend to be lost in the other waste fractions during the process. So how can this value actually be recovered from the product? Um, an approach to strategically remove and concentrate these materials of interest separately to, um, can be used to give a high quality recyclet. So to do this, we would utilize new technologies um, and develop new methods, such as automated robotic disassembly. So here we have a couple of images of uh, the robot arm we have available at Loughborough. It's a Staubly six axis robot, which gives it a very good range of motion. And as you can see here, it's got several tools and a tool rack to help us um, extract these materials throughout this sub-project. So, our approach of uh, pre-concentration um, is to carry out the automated robotic disassembly in three stages. Initially, we'll be carrying out a manual disassembly, which will be non-destructive and mostly exploratory. So the aim is to be figure out the best methods to remove the casings, locate the valuable materials within these components, and the best way to then extract them. The second stage, which will involve the robot arm, um, we'll be developing and testing the automated semi-destructive disassembly processes. This again will be based on uh, the information we gain from the manual disassembly and use the robot arm to again locate the important materials and then work out the best method for extracting those. Um, the third stage will invo involve validation and improvement of the process. So this is to increase the repeatability of the process as well as the speed. So then we can disassemble more products in the same time. Post-robotic disassembly, we aim to develop um, further waste fragmentation and separation processes for the materials extracted. This um, will most likely be developed as a further sub-project later in the grand challenge. So now moving on to the second uh, sub-project, which is modeling. So what are the largest challenges with existing waste monitoring and modeling? Well, many companies today state they're eliminating waste, yet there is no significant decreases of waste heading to landfills. So why is this? We've identified that there is actually inadequate support for waste modeling at a supply chain level. So when companies actually say they're eliminating waste, often this means that waste is simply being diverted from landfills, possibly to incinerators. So Incineration, even with energy recovery, is not eliminating waste, but more losing the value from that waste. You do gain a small percentage of uh, the energy back from these products, but nowhere near the same amount that's been embodied into that product. So, another example. Uh, when companies become zero waste, this often leads to waste being moved up and down the supply chain. So, how can this flow of waste be visualized to see whether we are actually eliminating or simply moving wastes? So the approach would be to develop um, a tool where waste modeling can be proceduralized in a simple manner um, all the way across the supply chain. So to do this, we'd utilize Sankey diagrams um, to give a clear visual representation of waste flows at different levels of the supply chain. So as Nancy mentioned before, um, uh, Sankey diagrams are very good for displaying waste flows. So adopting this, uh, sorry, for material flows rather. So adopting this for waste flows seems like the next step in this particular project. Here we have an example of uh, uh, material flows in the UK. Uh, it's been taken from the uh, RAP website. And those of you that are unfamiliar with Sankey diagrams, the arrows represent the magnitude of the flow at that particular point. 
So in this case, it's million tons of material flow. So here we have the inputs, um, the material then flowing onto the consumption level, and the outputs from that consumption. So for clear visualization of waste through the supply chain, our approach was to collect data from each individual supply, uh, supplier in that chain, enter this into a database, and create individual Sankey diagrams. This would allow you to see each factory's waste flow. This data could then be amalgamated or combined into a new data, into another database, and a Sankey diagram generated for the entire supply chain. This would mean if a company becomes zero waste, we can truly see whether the waste is being eliminated or simply moved elsewhere within the supply chain. So I'm now going to take you through the uh, uh, demo tool that we've created so far. Right. So this tool has been created in Excel, as many people are familiar with the way Excel works and shouldn't be scared off by any compl complex uh, programs. So the tool is very proceduralized. So the waste, excuse me. So the wastes are listed in three sections. The first stage is a very broad description of the waste. So here we can see simply waste from manufacture and municipal waste. This quantities of each supply chain supplier can be entered into this um, relatively simply. The next section allows you to enter the data in a more detailed manner. So waste from manufacturing can be split into waste from removal of paint or varnish, or for another example from coatings. So as we progress then on to the third section, this becomes even more detailed with the waste being very specifically categorized. This then ends up with a full waste code at the end. This was based on the European Waste Catalogue, which at the moment is being um, investigated to bring into European legislation so that waste can be standardized across um, the European states. So this was a, a method to future-proof this to some degree. So the next section allows you to calculate some very simple representations of the data that's been entered. Again, at a, at a very uh, broad level, intermediate level, and then a very detailed level. However, that doesn't really tell you very much information about the flow of the wastes. In the next section, um, the actual tool is linked to uh, eSankey, but for now I'm just using a demonstration um, Sankey diagram. Um, this allows you to generate a Sankey diagram for the waste flows within that individual supplier. The data from all these individual suppliers can then be, again, as I mentioned before, collected into a singular database, so the Sankey diagram can be generated for the entire supply chain. So this would allow you to see whether waste is being eliminated or, again, simply moved somewhere else. This method was proceduralized so that no experti real expertise is needed to actually use it. So it allows people to generate Sankey diagrams who may be unfamiliar with them or haven't um, even seen them before. So now moving on to the uh, third sub-project, which involves the management area. So what are the big challenges encountered in waste management, measurement, and decision-making? Well, decisions for waste management are based typically on cost and availability of facilities. This often leads to the environment not being considered, as information is usually difficult, costly, time-consuming, and often requires specific expertise to actually use an efficient program to visualize or um, get some numbers. So an example of this is within Europe, approximately 38% of all waste is sent directly to landfill. So this is especially true in Eastern Europe, where the closest and most cost-effective method of getting rid of waste is often landfill. So an awareness of the environmental impacts at different waste management options is needed just to help companies to make more informed decisions on what to do with their waste. So how can these environmental factors be included in the selection of waste management options? Well, an approach would be to develop simple key performance indicators and uh, simple metrics to raise the environmental awareness. 
And to do this, we develop new metrics and KPIs which can consider the environments and can be used alongside existing operational and waste management planning activities. This would allow all three to hopefully work in unison to generate um, effective environmental waste management options. So our approach to this was to look at the existing waste management um, assessment tools, such as LCA and cost-benefit analysis. Um, I realize these aren't very clear on this presentation, but uh, <laughs> I'm fairly sure most people are familiar with these. So what we found was these methods tend to be very complex. They take a lot of time to uh, carry out, where the actual end result tends to be outdated by the time it's actually delivered. Further sub-projects will be um, confirmed further on down the project, but some examples include um, the future of shoe recycling techniques and the possibility, as mentioned before in the presentation, of creating further fragmentation and processing techniques for um, valuable materials after they've been pre-concentrated. As James mentioned before, um, a PhD student will be starting in October who will cover a range of these future activities. Now, as we can see here, these projects aren't all to be carried out separately. The majority of them will be linked together in some form or another, so the information is transferable to some degree. So now, what do we need from industrial partners? As you can see, we've put quite a lot of effort into the concepts for these um, sub-projects, and any suitable case studies that you might be able to think uh, of them would be uh, very much appreciated. Also, any guidance and advice with the sub-projects to move them closer towards achieving the manufacturing aims would be gratefully received, and any more further suggestions for sub-projects uh, sub would be fantastic. So, now moving on to eco-intelligent manufacturing, uh, done by my colleague, so thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Barbud. So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alessandro Simeone, a research associate at the University of Loughborough uh, on Eco Intelligent Manufacturing Grand Challenge Project. So, this afternoon, we are going to have an overview of the definition of the eco, eco intelligent manufacturing concept. Um, and then we will illustrate the implementation through the uh, illustration of three sub-projects regarding um, technology, modeling, and management, respectively. And then we'll see also some future plan and uh, industrial involvement. So during the last decades, decades uh, the um, industrial companies, industrial partners, have been developed the procedures, techniques, and tools to optimize the production from the point of view of costs, material, and information all along the supply chain. What is missing now, currently, is a, a particular attention to the uh, environmental impact. Uh, how? Through a better informed decision making, still all along the supply chain. So to give uh, eco-awareness to the manufacturing decision, and giving uh, eco-awareness to the manufacturing decision is the objective of our project. How can this be implemented? This can be implemented in two different ways, in two complementary ways, which is the increasing of the automation through improving uh, the sensoring technologies. We are talking here of uh, the eco-intelligent factory, improving the short-term de short decision at operational level, even real-time decision. And then we can operate, we can act on the availability of eco-information through the design of a key performance indicator and uh, with the development of management and control uh, tools to incorporate the environmental sensibility. And uh, here we define, we are defining the eco-intelligent manufacturing scope, respectively for mid-term and long-term decision. So the main, the most important directions of our research are developing the technologies to, uh, to get to improve our real-time decision-making, uh, eco-aware decision-making uh, support system, and then develop the metrics to support an environmentally focused decision-making for mid-term, and uh, also to develop uh, the um, uh, intelligent sustainable management control system for long-term decision-making. And it's important here to underline how the output of one single sub-project, uh, or one single uh, direction can be the input for the higher level uh, scope. 
The first uh, sub-project I'm going to illustrate you is the intelligent monitoring of manufacturing processes. The process monitoring can be useful for the very, uh, very useful for the minimization of disruption time in production, as well as for defects reduction, energy saving, and failure prevention. In this particular case study that I'm going to explain today, we've been focusing on um, two-state identification carried, on, carried out on milling uh, process on aluminum uh, alloys and uh, with particular regards on the, uh, to the um, uh, surface integrity preservation and cutting parameters optimization. The procedure, the approach we utilized was to uh, set up an experimental, um, an exp some uh, experimental campaign to the utilization of a milling tool and uh, the utilization of an uh, infrared camera that we, be, we utilized to acquire infrared temperature signals to be then processed with advanced uh, signal processing techniques in order to extract some significant features that describes this phenomenon. And then the features extracted from the signal are, are uh, inputted into an artificial uh, intelligent decision making system in order to assess the tool state. So here I reported the, uh, the our experimental setup and in the video that I'm running now you will be able to see how uh, M milling processing uh, carried, on, uh, carried out on aluminum, aluminum uh, alloy is uh, monitored through an infrared camera. And uh, this is how it appears. Of course, this is a representation in false colors. Uh, the brightest colors correspond to the highest temperature. The signals and the features we uh, obtained from this monitoring are then correlated to the two wear measurements that we carried out on, the, uh, on, on our uh, milling tools. Well, the signals that uh, we acquired, and then processed in order to extract significant features. In this way, in this plot, it's very easy to recognize which signal is belonging to the fresh tool and which signal is belonging to the worn tool. And then from each of these signals, we extracted the features that we inputted into a neural network system, a neural net decision making system, in order to assess the nonlinear uh, relationship between the input which in, case, in this case are our features, and the output, which is the tool state. So the neural networks are, uh, um, is a system that is able to forecast and uh, uh, to assess a particular nonlinear relationship between input and output, and it can be applied to many other manufacturing, uh, machining and manufacturing processes. Up to now, the current results uh, are very uh, satisfactory. We are able to assess the tool wear tool state with a 95% of success rate. Then, moving on to the mid-term decision-making level, the uh, sub-project sub that I'm going to illustrate now is the environmental impact assessment in inventory management. Of course, uh, inventory management is a common uh, example of mid-term decision making as well as production, production scheduling or, or the promising. And uh, the most important aspects of the inventory management, one of the most important aspects is the economical order quantity, which was a model developed by Harris a uh, long time ago during the 30s, in which the main uh, most important parameters are the lead time, the waste and disposal, the energy and the logistics. Further on, uh, during by time, uh, this concept has been extended to try to incorporate the environmental sustainability. And this, has been, uh, this uh, extension has been carried out by applying uh, some more coefficients, constraints, to the analytical model of the uh, economic order quantity by considering the carbon, the carbon footprint, direct accounting, the carbon tax schedule, direct cap, cap and trade, the camp carbon offset are the most important uh, it's a coefficient extension of, of the uh, environmental sustainability in uh, economic order quantity. But it may not be sufficient for uh, uh, industrial practical purposes. So if we want to have an eco-aware inventory planning improvement from an uh, environmental uh, sustainability point of view, we can uh, have these uh, main issues, this main direction of research, which is the uh, product complexity, including also package, uh, packaging efficiency, lead time, production stores, cost customers location, as well as the time response, system stability, and surplus, surplus, surplus level, as well as material energy, uh, material emission efficiency and technology. These uh, 
these are the main directions, can be useful to develop our bespoke customized KPIs for an uh, eco, FP, eco um, aware uh, key performance indicator. We, I reported here some potential key performance indicator that can incorporate also the sustainability uh, concept like a storage uh, efficiency index or transportation efficiency, including volume or weight of our particular product, and energy consumption. The relationship that, can, that, that is uh, uh, between the key performance indicator and the, the general environmental uh, impact assessment may be, for, for example, not linear. So we could need some artificial intelligence techniques in order to optimize uh, the in, uh, our inventory model in terms of quantity of environmental impact, but we can also have the need to uh, forecast our environmental impact assessment, and we can do this by applying artificial intelligence tools. Now, moving to a long-term decision-making uh, level, we can see uh, to the, this project, which is called, uh, which is called Intelligent Business Management using the Sustainability Balance Scorecard. Let's suppose, we have an example, that the vision of uh, our industrial partners is to change the strategy from a high-volume, low-cost approach to low-volume, high-cost approach. And of course, we want to change this strategy by uh, incorporating also sustainability and environmental uh, aspects. And we have, of course, to translate this strategy change into real actions. How can we do this? Well, a very <laughs> smart uh, tool, a strategic tool for translating the strategy into real actions is the balanced scorecard, which has been developed by Kaplan and Norton in the early 90s. And this, the main objective of this, um, of this strategic tool are the performance evaluation and this translation into real actions of the strategies, of the industrial strategies. How? Well, by looking, by watching at this strategy from four different perspectives. Of course, the financial perspective, the customer perspective, the internal business, so the process perspective, and the learning and growth perspective. Of course, in this diagram, in this early early state uh, strategic tool, there isn't any reference uh, to the sustainability. So we have to embed the sustainability. How can we embed the sustainability? For example, by, intro, uh, by the introduction of an additional non-market perspective uh, into the balanced scorecard. Of course, uh, these uh, uh, perspectives uh, are characterized by specific uh, key performance indicator. We have key performance indicator for financial uh, perspective, for customer perspective, for internal business process perspective, and for learning and group. Of course, we have to define some sustainability KPIs in order to describe this perspective. In this table, I just reported the most common key performance indicator for some sustainability perspective, and uh, it's important just to say that they can be, uh, yeah, a lot, but they can be clustered and categorized into six main uh, areas uh, regarding energy, water, waste, environmental preservation, society, and uh, lowering noise and emissions. The procedure in order that we can utilize to implement an, um, balance, uh, a sustainable uh, balance scorecard uh, procedure to an industrial case uh, is uh, made of these main three, these, uh, three main steps. The first one is the data collection. It can be carried out by utilizing different methods uh, or combine them as well. For example, the expert board uh, or uh, submitting questionnaires with the Delphi method, data from the database, data from the KPIs that we obtained with the previous project. We will utilize this data and we will process this data through some analytic techniques. Here I propose the, the analytical network process uh, utilizing the fuzzy logic approach because we can also have the need to model a sort of uncertainty. And we, we can use this data to assess, uh, uh, to make an evaluation of our performance uh, of our single uh, specific uh, KPI. We can, we can uh, assess, we can uh, perform a performance evaluation or forecasting or selection among alternatives by utilizing artificial in intelligent techniques <laughs> such as a neural network. It depends, of course, on our specific, uh, on our specific purpose. The mm, outcome of uh, our research project uh, can be uh, divided into three main um, 
the main categories, which is the, the hardware, technologies category, and uh, also modeling and measurement, and control and management. Uh, of course, the main contribution will be given from myself and from the PhD student that will be appointed in the next weeks. Uh, and we will uh, mm, develop together uh, this, uh, mm, uh, this uh, uh, <laughs> sub-project, like, for example, the intelligent monitoring of manufacturing processes, we did with the infrared monitoring of milling processes, which is a, a mixture of hardware, the sensors, the camera, and software, the loop, the control that you apply on your machining processes or your ma manufacturing processes. This data can be, um, the outcome of this data can be useful to uh, develop an eco ERP software that, so software package for example, that together with other uh, sub project like eco intelligent inventory planning can be useful to develop the management tool like, this, uh, like uh, the one I proposed which is the intelligent sustainability balance scorecard which is, use, uh, which is useful to assess or to forecast the performance of your company in terms of single key performance indicator. What did we see today? That we, uh, <coughs> we saw that it is possible to improve the decision making of our manufacturing processes in three ways. In the short term, by improving the sensing technology. In the mid term, in the tactical, let's say, tactical perspective, by designing or developing some specific KPI for environmental impact assessment modeling. And long term decision making can be improved by developing an intelligent management tool for eco aware uh, business strategy. Now, what I would like to <laughs> ask you, industrial partners, is to together to identify some sustainability weaknesses along your decision making uh, chain and together also to get. To, to have access or to mm, acquire some with the, some technologies information related to your current decision making in order to develop together a case study in which we can improve with the sensor, uh, environmental sensibility both the technology modeling of your midterm scheduling production and also the management and control with the strong with the strong eco awareness of your decision making this was my presentation and uh, it's over. Thank you.